was particularly fantastic to see so many different organizations and groups from different countries coming together to start dealing with the questions of how to build an international movement and a federated movement where different groups are considered autonomous and, and in charge of their actions within their local contexts uh, while still building a common infrastructure. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that tomorrow in the Building the MMT Movement panel. Um, but Dirk is also uh, interested in and, and, and spent a lot of time thinking about ecological uh, affairs, so it's a perfect person to introduce this next panel on um, Green New Deal and MMT. Thank you, Robert. I would like to thank the Modern Money Network for, for having me. Um, before I introduce you the panel here on the Green New Deal, um, let me just talk a little bit about what's going on in Europe. Um, because we've also had our, our Green New Deal moment. Um, in Germany it came in 2009 when the Green Party introduced the Green New Deal uh, and they, they uh, incorporated that into their, their platform, into their election uh, platform. Um, so that was 10 years ago, um, at the height of the great financial crisis, when it turned into a, a European crisis. Um, and by now, the Green Party is the party that is polling best in the United uh, in the uh, in Germany. Um, so it has 28 uh, percent, and it's being at the same level as the Conservative Party. Um, so in, in Germany and in other countries, we we have moved uh, forward quite a lot. Um, of course, this Green New Deal by the Green Party was not an, an MMT-based Green New Deal, but nevertheless, it was inspired by the, by the New Deal uh, of the Great Depression. Um, so this year, I had organized the conference uh, in, in Europe in Berlin, the first European MMT conference. Uh, and shortly afterwards, uh, I was asked to, to consult uh, the leader of the Socialist Youth Party, or Youth Group of, of Austria, uh, a candidate for the European uh, election uh, by name of Julia Herr. And uh, I wrote a Green New Deal for her, about eight or nine pages, uh, with two colleagues. Um, and that was linked uh, into the party platform of the Social Democrats of Austria. Um, it was very surprising for us because I've never counseled anybody from Austria before. Um, but they took this proposal and incorporated that into the party platform. And now, uh, on Sunday, there will be elections in Austria. I'm afraid that the Social Democrats won't do very well, but at least their party platform uh, basically says that we, that they will uh, fight for a job guarantee, um, they will fight for a minimum job of 1,700 euros per month tax-free, which is roughly $1,800 uh, per month tax-free. Um, they have incorporated elements of the Green New Deal that we introduced in April. Um, so I can tell you that in Europe things are moving, uh, and they're moving very quickly. Um, also, we have this Green New Deal for Europe platform, which uh, has been published at the beginning of September. So we argue that the Green New Deal must be created to move Europe forward. Because everybody knows on the whole planet uh, that we have to coordinate our actions. Okay? So the US alone cannot stop climate change. Europe alone cannot stop climate change. So we need to work together. Um, but I think that, that in Europe now, that people have understood that somebody needs to stop. Okay? And I think it's very important politically that, that we have this movement all over the world, that we're trying to, to make this happen, and that we do not get bogged down by things like, okay, but what if the Chinese don't join us, or what if the, the Americans don't join us from the European perspective, or what if Europe doesn't join? Um, so, so, of course, there could be a problem of free riding that, that some people or some, some countries are doing some kind of green new deal, using less energy, using less oil, and the oil price comes down, and the other countries get more competitive because of that. Yes, that is the problem. Um, and that needs to be addressed. So, so this Green New Deal thing, it's, it's a very complicated matter. And we have not been there before. So, so when I was looking at the other panel, which was ended, uh, it said that it, it all goes down to, to stuff that we, we seem to know from the Enlightenment. Um, and if you look into the Enlightenment in economics, we, we always have saw that nature is something which is kind of exogenous. Okay, but, but now we live in the age uh, when we are basically managing the, the whole planet. Okay, so we have a very big influence on that planet, on this planet. So, so we should take responsibility. Uh, but this method, of course, needs a while to think in, think in because it does not resonate well with this kind of, of Kantian enlightenment issues. Okay, so 
region has nothing to do with it, or maybe a little bit. But if this is not about individual reason, this is about collective action. Okay, and this is why sometimes it is very hard, uh, at least in Europe, um, to, to maybe make people uh, believe that we, we can do this, that we have to do this together, because we're not, we're not really used to doing things together anymore. Okay, so this is, I think, why, why MMT is just the beginning of a conversation, which is also a conversation about what is political economy slash economics, and also what is Western modern science. So, so I completely agree with the last panel that we need to, to study those questions, and I, I think that tomorrow there will be a workshop tomorrow morning uh, on the question, what do we need to do with, with economics, with political economy. Um, okay, so one last word, the, the Green Video for Europe platform, that is something which is, is very, very successful in terms of getting lots of different people together from different groups. And one of the, the things that we also address in this, in this uh, Green Video for Europe is that we want to bring it down to the people. Okay, so we basically say we want to give money to communities. Yes, the federal government pays money to, to make this green video possible, but we give money also at the local level so people can come together and think about how to spend that money, how to use these resources wisely. Okay, so we think that we can also reinvigorate democracy by, by delivering the green video on, on a very low level so that people can participate and that they can basically say, yeah, I care about the environment, I want to help. Let's, let's gather around the table and let's try to discuss how we will use these resources uh, that we have. And I think that is something which, which also should be stressed, that of course MMT is, is just a description of reality in terms of how money works, but of course you cannot describe how money works without thinking about how to improve the world. Okay, that is impossible. Um, so I think that now we are ready to, to think about how to improve the world. So let me introduce the panelists. Um, so first we have Yeva Nesician, um, let me just have a look. He's an associate professor of economics at Frank Allen Marshall College, um, and we've, we've known for 10 years, I think, from conferences in Europe and also in the US. Um, then we have uh, Mike Dickinson, who is an assistant professor of interdisciplinary studies from Gutman Community College in New York, I think. Yes. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, Fadiel Kabu, who is an associate professor of economics at Denison University, and who is also the president of the Global Institute for Sustainable. Uh, prosperity. And uh, last but not least, we have Mason Tankers over there, um, who is also a research scholar at the Global Institute of Sustainable Prosperity and the research director of the Modern Money Network. Okay, so thanks for, for being with us. And uh, I think that um, we can start with presentations. Uh, Fadel, would you go first? Uh, hi, thank you everybody for, for being here. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to speak on this on this panel. Um, sometimes people ask me, are you an academic or an activist? As if they're like two separate universes we're supposed to fit into those things. I, I can do the academic -y stuff, I'm happy to do it, go to conferences, wear suits, clean up okay. But I also, you know, know how to wear my you know sunrise t-shirts and real progressive t-shirts and Talk to talk to activists and work in the field. So I do both. I, I have my MMT lens, and I also have an implant. It's my uh, progressive uh, lens. So uh, there's no no distinction for me. I'm definitely not going on the other side. All right. So a quick overview. My main message: We have a climate crisis, uh, a climate emergency. The planet is on fire. I don't think I need to convince you. Number two, we have millions of people who want to work in this country and around the world. And even better, we have a third thing, green technology and innovations that are more available, more efficient, and cheaper, getting cheaper by the day. And all we have to do is just put these three things together. What are we waiting for? Um, and this is where MMT comes in, because we're told the government is broke and ran out of money, it's going to cause hyperinflation, Zimbabwe, the whole list of, you know, Venezuela and all of that. And this is where MMT comes in with that lens and says, wait a minute. You know, sovereign governments operate under a different framework. It's not like you and I, households or, or individuals. So how can we pay for World War II? This is a question that we always, you know, bring to activists and policymakers and say, 
Wait a minute, you're saying this green new building is too expensive, it's unaffordable? World War II came after the Great Depression, the most miserable time in, in world history. There is no money to be taxed, and there is no money to be borrowed. Those who believe that we need to tax or borrow to fund the Green New Deal. So how did we pay for World War II? There was an emergency, it became a national priority, and the government paid for it. And that created hundreds of thousands of jobs, put tons of money into the economy, decent wages, and that could have led to inflationary pressure in the economy with lots of people going out on a shopping spree to buy new cars, to buy new homes. And that's where, quote unquote, the borrowing came in. That's where the taxing came in. It wasn't the fund the war, the war was already in full swing. The real resources is what mattered, right? And this is going to be the, one of the main focuses of, of this panel, is shifting the conversation about the things that matter in terms of fighting this, this climate crisis, the real resource side. Uh, Scott Fulbright always says this beautiful line where he says, MMT, and MMT, one of the things that we need to think about is that money is the least important thing, right? It's not about money, it's about all the other things. Right. So, just to set you know, the, the stage for uh, a few people here who are new to MMT, um, what do we mean by monetary sovereignty? Because people think, think monetary sovereignty, all sovereign governments have monetary sovereignty, they can print their money. That's not what we mean. Monetary sovereignty means a country can issue its own currency. A lot of countries can do that. Uh, some countries decided not to do that anymore. Uh, Ecuador, for example, or some of the Eurozone countries. Number two, a country collects taxes in the same national currency. That's pretty easy. Most countries can do that. And then three and four is where some countries start to lose their monetary sovereignty. So number three, only issue debt or only issue bonds denominated in the national currency. In other words, no external debt. In the case of the US, the entire national debt is denominated in US dollars. In the case of Japan, the entire debt is in Japanese yen. So you have those countries that enjoy full monetary sovereignty. And four is related to it. So don't fix your exchange rate to gold. Don't fix your exchange rate to a dollar or to a foreign currency because then you lose monetary sovereignty. Right? And again, developing countries fall into that trap for reasons that we will discuss tomorrow on one of the panels. Right? So if you have these four, you have full monetary sovereignty and then you have plenty of fiscal policy space. Not unlimited, plenty of fiscal policy space, limited only by potential inflationary pressure limited only by the productive capacity, and I should add, limited also by the power structure and the legal structure that dictates who gets to set prices, who gets to control resources, who gets to regulate certain industries. Those are also real constraints. And that's why the MMT lens clarifies what matters, who's in charge, and then we use the power of regulation and taxation, the democratic process, to tackle those issues as opposed to saying, we run out of money, there's nothing we can do. So, so the key distinction as a result is between the issuer of the currency, the national government, the federal government, and the rest of us, users of the currency, households, individuals, local municipalities, and states, we operate under, under a different set of financial principles. You and I have to work hard, earn an income, then spend it. And if we want to spend more, we have to borrow accumulate debt, which means we have to pay it off with interest, which means we have to work harder, earn more money, or spend less to pay for it. Same thing for states and municipalities and companies and individuals, currency users, right? The national government operates under a different principle. It's the issue of the currency. It's a matter of logic. It has to spend money into existence so that the rest of us can use it, spend it, borrow it, lend it to each other and then it collects taxes as a, as a reflux. It, it, in a sense, it, it's a sequence of events that happens, spend first, tax later. So that means the purpose of taxation is not to fund things. It's a completely different role for taxation, which I think Nathan also addressed today. So that doesn't mean MMT says, we shouldn't be taxing the rich, we shouldn't be taxing oil companies. This is my you know, political lens here. Definitely tax the rich, definitely tax corporations to reduce their power and influence in the economy, to protect democracy from oligarchy, 
tax wage to reduce inequality. Not because we need their money or their permission to do all these things, but because these things matter in a democratic uh, society and matter for economic purposes and matter, matter for inflationary purposes. Right? But not because we need money or permission to fund the Green New Deal. So, there's a spectrum of monetary sovereignty. Not all countries have full monetary sovereignty. So based on that definition, you have countries like the US, Japan, the UK, Australia that enjoy full monetary sovereignty, have plenty of you know, fiscal policy space to intervene. And those countries should be innovators in fighting climate change and addressing these issues. But then you have countries that, on the other extreme, have completely gave up their national sovereign, monetary sovereignty, like Ecuador, countries that dollarize, or countries that decide, you know, we don't trust you know, fiscal authorities and politicians with, with, the, with the power of the purse, we're going to completely remove them out of their sovereignty. But most developing countries are kind of in between, depending on the level of um, external debt that they, that they have. So again, we'll talk about that tomorrow. So for me, the Green New Deal, with all the great discussions that we've had over the last few months about its potential, we can't have a Green New Deal without a job guarantee. It's not an add-on. This is not like, you know, progressive or the, the beautiful progressive shopping list that we want to include in the Green Union. This is a key feature, and it's technical. It's not just a nice cow, right? So the philosophy for me for the Green New Deal is that, and for a job guarantee, is that you take people as they are, where they are, and you do on-the-job pay training with benefits, a comprehensive set of benefits. So we don't tell people, move to San Francisco, learn how to code, that's where the jobs are. Right? That, that doesn't work. So, in other words, we don't give up on people, we lift everybody up to higher grounds, and we rebuild communities from, from within. That's very, that's very important. The other reason the job guarantee is important is the Green New Deal, one of the goals is to decarbonize the economy, end the fossil fuel extraction, and transform the entire engine of the we will displace workers, we will displace industries, but without a job guarantee, we will not have a just transition. The goal is to end fossil fuel extraction and pollution, but not to end people's livelihoods. So this is a key component. We can't have this without a just transition, without a job guarantee. Um, so what is the Green New Deal? Federally funded, there's only a federal government can do it. Locally implemented in a decentralized way. Uh, it's urban and rural, it's inclusive, it's just, it's restorative. We can't afford to have a haphazard you know, climate change you know, policy without addressing the needs of communities from, from within. It needs to be comprehensive and, and permanent. We can't do this for a few years and, and give up on this. This is massive. The good news is that the job guarantee is the most popular policy in the United States today, hands down. And this really surprised a lot of Democrats who paid for these you know, polling companies to do this. And that's why when, when this came out, all of a sudden, everybody was running for president. They don't even know what a job guarantee is. Now they're in favor of a job guarantee, which is okay. Um, so the Green New Deal, the same thing. This is massively popular, uh, including for Republicans and Trump voters. You know, not the majority, but. 35% of Trump voters are okay with the Green New Deal because guess what? They like clean water and they like clean soil and they like clean air. But they're afraid, because of the dominant narrative, that their job is going to be on the line or they're going to have to pay higher taxes to pay for this. So the MMP lens here comes in to empower people of all political persuasions that this is not political in a sense. This is technical. This is how we pay for it. Your job is not online, and your taxes may not have to go up, because we're not going to tax the working class and the middle class to pay for this, because we know better, right? All right, so this is a job guarantee also uh, map. So can we afford it? Yes, we can. Can we afford this? Can we afford the consequences of climate change? Can we afford this global warming that's spiraling out of control? So we have to change the narrative about what are the real consequences of inaction. Those who say it's too expensive to do a Green New Deal, they have to say it's too expensive not to introduce a Green New Deal. We're already paying many times over the actual cost of what we want to introduce by not doing anything. 
because what we're doing is we're paying for cancer treatment for generations of individuals and asthma treatments. All of these things, by the way, produce economic growth that gets celebrated on TV. But instead, we want to clean the water source and use renewable energy so we don't have to pay for the negative consequences of air pollution and soil pollution and so on. Um, so change the narrative. This is not affordable. This is not affordable. This is too expensive. This is too painful. This is not right and too expensive. Right? Change the narrative. So, and this is where you know, bringing the public into this conversation about quality of life versus standard of living. Because they're being said this GDP growth is the only way. There is no alternative, right? What we want to say is, let's look at the real metric that really matters for quality of life. Regardless of political persuasion, people want better quality of life. So using something like the Genuine Progress Indicator, GPI, to show that we've been stagnating in terms of quality of life, and people know it because people live it. They just don't know what's, they just blame something else for their struggles, for the stagnation of quality of life, for pollution, for illnesses, and so on. So we have to empower people with a metric, with a narrative, and with a clear lens that says this is how we pay for it, and this is what, uh, how we do it. So in conclusion, and I, I left quite a few of the details to some of my colleagues on the panel to fill in, but I'm happy to answer questions. So number one, we're running out of time. There's no time to start with small experimental and incremental, you know, centrist third way type of uh, policies, bold action. The climate crisis, the inequality crisis, the poverty, socioeconomic exclusion, and justice, these things call for bold and transformative action, not small and experimental actions. So what we have so far, the policies for climate, for jobs, are too weak, too slow, too expensive, and they don't even work. Sustainable prosperity is our only way out. So it's not either jobs or climate. There's, there's no trade-off. We know how to do this without bankrupting the country, without causing hyperinflation, without eliminating you know, people's sources of livelihood, without the just transition. We know how to do this, we have the mechanics, we have the details. So economic justice and climate justice with a living wage free in deal, this is possible, desirable, and affordable. Thank you. So I'm an anthropologist, not an economist. Um, so I come with a slightly different perspective in some ways, and very much more on the ground. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about a few things. One is the potential for a Green New Deal to transform the politics of food and hunger um, in the United States. Um, Partly because I come at this as a welfare state scholar, so the conversation about a Green New Deal is obviously very resonant with welfare state politics as we've known them. And so the first thing I want to do is think about where our welfare state is today. Uh, and this will be from a U.S. perspective, so I'm sorry for those of you who are non-U.S. Uh, it's my bias, sorry. <laughs> so since the turn of the millennium in the 21st century, we have seen an unprecedented outpouring of food assistance, in particular, in the United States. That includes both SNAP, which is the program that used to be called food stamps, right? But also things like emergency food. So the charitable food networks, soup kitchens, food banks. Um, and this is just to give you a little bit of a sense of this growth. So during the George W. Bush administration, Right? Under a Republican administration, the food stamp rolls rose from about 18 million in 2001 to 27 million in 2008. And then this growth, of course, gained even more momentum with the recession that began in 2000, 2008, reaching 47 million Americans in 2012. That's 15% of the U.S. population that was enrolled in food stamps at the height of the recession. And those numbers have actually stayed relatively stable 
just despite the fact that we've had an official economic recovery. So in 2017, about 42 million people were enrolled in food stores. Um, when it comes to emergency food, there's also been massive growth in that sector. From 25 million people served by soup kitchens and food pantries in 2005 to 46.5 million in 2012. So food assistance has basically become the leading edge of our response to growing poverty and economic insecurity in the United States. And yet, despite this massive expansion of the food safety net, more than 41 million Americans experienced food insecurity, which is the very wonky term that we use for hunger here in the United States. Um, 41 million Americans experienced food insecurity, right? And in fact, levels of food insecurity have remained basically flat since the USDA began collecting this data in 1995. So we have a situation where more help has not resulted in less hunger. So this is my question. Why hasn't growing assistance led to less food insecurity? And really for the purposes of the panel today, what I want to focus on are what kind of politics could actually end hunger in the United States? So I want to do two things. The first thing I want to do is lay out some of the parameters of the current welfare state configuration in the US. And then the second thing I want to do is talk about how a Green New Deal really opens up possibilities for ending hunger here uh, in the United States. So the conventional wisdom is that welfare programs have been continually cut back, systematically dismantled, both in the US and globally since the 1980s. I think we're all pretty familiar with that story. I would argue that the expansion of food assistance, it actually tells a different story and a more accurate one. Globally, we've seen the expansion of conditional cash transfer programs. So we have things like Bolsa Familia in Brazil, Promesa, and Oportunidades in Mexico, South Africa. Um, but that's also true in the United States, which has long been considered ground zero for neoliberal welfare state retrenchment. Um, so, in fact, welfare state spending in the U.S., and in particular, programs that are targeted to poor people, low-income households, have been growing since the mid-1980s. And those programs are what we often refer to as the means-tested programs. Right? This growth has been targeted specifically to working poor households. It's subsidizing low wages through programs like SNAP, and also I think the other big one is the Earned Income Tax Credit. And actually, the transformation of food assistance is really in many ways modeled on the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit, in that increasingly it's subsidizing low wages and excluding people who are outside of the formal labor market. Um, Food stamps have seen a really remarkable turnaround from a stigmatized welfare program since the 1980s to what's now called a valued work support. And when you talk to policymakers, a lot of times that's the language that they use. Uh, this began with Ronald Reagan, who used this coded racial language to conjure up an image of welfare users as black, when we know that the majority of the food stamp welfare users have always been and continue to be white. Um, he used these thinly veiled racist terms of the welfare queen to build support for a political agenda that was aimed at dismantling and undermining social protections for poor and working class people. And of course, this is part of a much bigger political and economic project. And then Clinton's welfare reforms in 1996 sort of solidified this bipartisan consensus of moving people from welfare to work. That was really the mantra at that time. Um, that legislation added work requirements to cash assistance and to food stamp programs that were meant to push people into the labor force. Ron Haskins, who is one of the architects of this legislation, uh, was quoted as saying, mothers on welfare, even with those with young children, should be encouraged, cajoled, and when necessary, forced to work. Right, so just thinking at the time. However, this promise that work would be the path to self-sufficiency, I think we all know was an illusion, right? Uh, the kinds of jobs that were available to women who were leaving the welfare roles in the 90s included care work of various kinds, caring for children, elderly people, home health aides. Um, and they found jobs in the tight labor markets of the 1990s, but very, very little relief from poverty. So in this context, what we've seen is that full-time working moms who are struggling to make ends meet uh, emerged as a new kind of deserving poor. And welfare spending and program administration since the 1990s has been 
transform to modify and expand some means-tested welfare benefits to subsidize old wages to make work pay. Um, and then on the other side of this, right, families who don't have access to formal employment. So when I was doing infographic research, people who are outside of the labor market, either because they're unemployed or they're in the informal economy in some way, they're subject to incredibly punitive workfare regimes when they attempt to access assistance. So in New York City, where I was doing this research, um, people were made to clean the parks, you know, the subways when they were unemployed and went to apply for assistance. And for that labor, at the time of my research, they were paying, being paid somewhere between $2.48 an hour and $4.18 an hour, right? from the work that they were being forced to do in exchange for welfare benefits. So workfare programs and work requirements that are targeted to the unemployed make it incredibly difficult for people to live, but also to maintain access to benefits. They're constantly being pushed off the rules. And I think we're seeing this again as the attempts to tighten work requirements for welfare state benefits, especially for food stamps. Now we've seen this in a couple states with Medicaid. Uh, a, few stamps, uh, a few states have added work requirements. Um, we're seeing that there's a group of people who fall outside of the labor market who are seen by many as a group that can be just sort of cut out of the social compact, excluded from social protections altogether, including food and health care. And the real winners, of course, in this policy configuration are low-wage employers who can pay their workers below subsistence wages and who have an increasingly desperate pool of laborers who will take a job under any condition, basically, because the system is so punitive. Of course, policymakers who are pushing for these work requirements, um, they would argue that we shouldn't actually worry about this, work requirements don't mean that anybody's going to go hungry, it's fine. And they point to this vast network of charitable food, right, to say that's actually where help should be coming from. Local communities from the heart, right, people who care. Um, Paul Ryan is famously has heaped praise on these institutions. This is him cleaning an already clean pot for a photo. <laughs> just like to stick this picture up there sometimes uh, when he was running for a re-election. So he said that our hearts and our conscience have called us to do the work that needs doing. And in some ways, it actually seems as if that's true. Um, so in New York City in 1979, the Food and Hunger Hotline was trying to find emergency food programs so that they could help connect people with meals. Uh, and at that time, they scoured the city. They found 30 food kitchen, soup kitchens and food pantries in all of New York City. Today, the Food Bank of New York City serves over a thousand of these institutions, many of them who serve thousands of meals a week to people in their communities. And nationally, there are 58,000 soup kitchens and food pantries, right? So it kind of seems like maybe our hearts and our consciences have been calling to us, except for that story isn't true, right? It's federal funding that's brought all of this giant network into being. Um, so I would say, in some ways, emergency food is kind of a classic example of public-private partnerships. And I just want to echo, uh, you know, what Nathan and others wrote in the recent op-ed. It's also kind of a warning about why we shouldn't be leaning on public-private partnerships when we're thinking about a green new deal. Right? Um, emergency food constitutes a third rail of the contemporary welfare state. So food pantries and soup kitchens before the 1980s were very small. They didn't have any regular or reliable funds. And then in 1983, Congress passed the TFAP legislation. It was the Temporary Emergency Food Assistance Program. And this legislation provided funds for surplus food. Um, in the early 80s, it was cheese, right? A lot of surplus dairy was being bought up from farmers. Um, but it also provided administrative funds, money to help small organizations pay to distribute this food. And it was these two streams, right, surplus food and also administrative fundings that gave communities that didn't have a food bank at the time an incentive to develop one. And obviously, it was an effective incentive, right? The problem with emergency food, of course, is that it's not uh, designed around protecting the right to food. You can't demand food from a food pantry. If they run out, too bad. If they don't treat you nice, there's really nothing you can do. It's not protected. Um, emergency food providers also rely very heavily on volunteer labor to distribute these resources. 
So 68% of food pantries uh, and 42% of soup kitchens report relying entirely on volunteers. They have no paid staff whatsoever. And I think it's partly because there are so many community members involved as volunteers that it really gives the impression that these are organizations that are from the heart, right? It hides the fact that it's really federal funding that's spurring them into being. Um, the other thing, of course, that this federal funding stream does is that it creates a food network that can deal with corporate food surpluses, right? This is the other side of it. Uh, food processors and retailers can dispose of foods that don't find a market, um, and then they also get a tax rate for doing that, right? And this is all while uh, burnishing their corporate image. Walmart is one of the major contributors to the emergency food networks in the United States. So EMPs are organized in ways that ensure that they can't fully meet the needs of the people who rely on them, their shoestring operations, they often turn people away because they don't have enough food. And volunteers play a really crucial role in deflecting people's complaints in these organizations. So I actually, uh, part of my research was working in a soup kitchen in a food pantry for three years. And one of the things that would happen is people would complain, right? People coming in would complain, why don't you have this? We heard about this earlier. And always there was somebody else in the line who would say, hey, don't give them a hard time. They're just volunteers. They don't need to be doing this, right? They don't need to be doing this. But the irony of it was, almost everybody who worked there as a regular volunteer really did need to be doing it, right? They were all uh, women working with, either not working at all or had very limited incomes, who relied very heavily on the food that they took home with them at the end of the day, right? So federal food assistance and emergency food providers um, they play an important role in making sure that people have something to eat, but as they're currently structured, they're designed to manage poverty and food insecurity, not to end it. So this brings us to the million dollar question, right? what would it take to end hunger in the United States? Um, there's long been arguments for a rights-based approach to food, and their groundbreaking work, um, John Jones and Mark Sen, point out that hunger and famine aren't caused by food shortages in the modern era, but what they call entitlement failures. So people lack food and resources because they can't make and then enforce a claim to the food that exists. And nowhere is this relationship between uh, food insecurity and entitlement failure more evident than right here in the United States because food is so bountiful and food waste and overproduction are such enormous problems. Um, we throw 30 to 40% of all the food that's grown in the United States away. And yet, when I was doing my research, I also regularly met people who would skip meals so that they, their kids would have something to eat at the end of the day. So in this context, uh, entitlement failure is bound up with this notion that work is and absolutely should be the primary mechanism for distributing goods and services. The right to food in the U.S. is tied to an obligation to work, and that's increasingly true. However, work has become, and I, you know, I'm assuming everyone here knows this, Work has become an increasingly ineffective system for distributing basic goods and services in the latter half of the 20th century and certainly into the 21st century. Uh, and I think we also know from the experiences of people of color, black men and women living in the United States, exploited immigrant laborers, um, that work has never actually been a particularly good system for ensuring access to goods and services for all people, right? Um, and the expansion of the food safety net that began in the early 21st century was really a political response to work as a failing system of distribution. Low-wage employees are basically offered work supports from the state in order to keep them afloat in an uncertain labor market. So ending food insecurity, ending hunger here, obviously demands a new politics of inclusion. The primary drivers of hunger are involuntary unemployment and work that doesn't pay enough for people to afford an apartment and food and their electricity bill, right? What most of the people who I met when I was doing this research wanted was a job that could do, do just that. But what they found, especially folks who were unemployed, when they sought out assistance, was a system that was designed to push them off the rolls, right? Uh, to get them off of assistance and into a job regardless of the conditions of that employment. Workfare is really designed um, to produce demoralized, desperate workers who will take any job under any conditions, and that's our policy configuration at this moment. So an inclusive politics 
that could actually speak to the needs and desires of people would flip work requirements on their head, right? And this is what a jobs guarantee does, right? And why it's so important that it's part of the Green New Deal conversation. When unemployed people seek assistance, they should be offered well-paid jobs that raise labor standards rather than lower them. Uh, arguments for a federal work guarantee build directly, right, directly on this idea that is absolutely at the heart of our current welfare configuration, that work should be the path out of poverty, but it acknowledges that this is not the case, right? That's not what's currently happening. And that's why, you know, I'm so happy to hear this, uh, Fidel saying, that's why the inclusion of federal jobs guarantee in Green New Deal language is so crucial. Because the jobs guarantee is really the cornerstone of a just transition, um, and a just transition that could end hunger in the United States. So instead of using hunger or the threat of hunger as a tool to kind of poke and prod people to accept low-paid and secure work, we could actually expand the right to food by expanding the right to well-paid employment and establishing full employment as a government mandate. And then I wanted to say also from a food systems perspective, um, a job guarantee also opens up the possibility for establishing all kinds of public institutions that can address so many of the food issues that we face in this country. 